Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Will McInnes, and this is another Brandwatch webinar. So the topic today, as I beam into your brains from sunny New York, is about democratizing data and decision making. And I originally put this talk together for the theme of this year's Social Media Week New York, which was about the invisible hand of technology. I think that's a really, really interesting theme. And hopefully, those of you with us today work broadly in the arena of data, in the domain of how intelligence drives decision making. And I think the, the idea of the invisible hand is really worth us playing around with. But it was a bit of a fussy title. It was a little bit overcomplicated. So I boiled it down in those panicky last 24 hours before giving the keynote. I boiled it down to this, which I like much more, which is a talk about making better decisions everywhere. I'm at Will McInnes on Twitter, and we are at Brandwatch, and if you have any comments or thoughts, please do chip in. Just quickly, so that we can get into the real content, a bit about Brandwatch. We've just been announced as leaders, both in the EMEA and North America wave by Forrester, as well as in the Asia Pacific wave. So we're very happy about that, and have lots of happy clients uh, around the world, and a global presence. As you can hear, I'm a Brit based in New York. What could possibly be more global? Let's get on to the content then. So this idea of the invisible hand, this idea of better decisions everywhere, let's play around with that a bit. Now, some of you know much better than I do that the invisible hand is a metaphor that was first used by the economist Adam Smith. And what he was talking about was the unintended social benefits that come from individual actions. And it's come, the phrase itself has come to capture this notion that if individuals pursue their own interests, there are often aggregate consequences that benefit us all, rather than if they were only trying to do things that were good for society. But in technology, it's come to mean something different. I think, and hopefully you think too, if I said to you, well, what's the invisible hand of technology? You'd start to think about the kind of things that I'm talking about in this talk. You'd start to think about the ways in which technology increasingly has a very powerful effect on our lives, but often we can't see that. And so I'd like to provoke you, I'd like to challenge you, and I'd like to suggest that you and we probably don't have a clue. We don't have a clue just how powerful that invisible hand is, just how frequently in every minute and every hour and every day of our lives, technology is making these subtle, or big decisions for us, or enabling a particular decision that we make. And that's what I want to explore, because the provocation I'd like to make to you is that these things control you, these algorithms. Algorithms and the invisible hand of the technology is having a very big effect on our lives. And there are some uh, professors, some friends of mine in the UK, who are specialists in habits. And they have, their research over several decades has suggested that humans think that they're in control. We've got this rather convenient idea that our brains make the decisions and then our bodies follow those. But what these professors' research shows, and in fact even books like Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, show us that actually the brain isn't always in control or in even often in control. It's just making up a narrative of what the body has decided to do. And when I think about how I eat at home and how often I find myself opening the fridge door and then I tell myself a little story about what I've done and why, um, it can kind of make sense to me. So who's this? I would love to know if any of you recognize this person. I only found this dude when I was researching my talk. This is actually Muhammad ibn Musa al-Karizmi, and I'm not sure if I've got the pronunciation right there. I would guess I probably haven't. His name has been Latinized as Algorithmi. He's a Persian mathematician, astronomer, and geographer, a scholar in the fantastically titled House of Wisdom in Baghdad. And he was around between 780 and 850. So this is the guy who first came up with the idea that then became known as 
algorithms. And to bring this idea of the invisible hand to life, I want to talk to you a bit now about how algorithms run or assist and enable your lives before bringing it back home to the traditional domain that we live and work in, the marketing work that we do, the social intelligence and insights work that we do. So you know this dude's name, and his name in its original Arabic form is the root of the word that we use every day today, algorithms. And algorithms are pretty crazy. Algorithms determine what music you listen to. So if you're like me, I love Spotify. I have to listen to music at work often in an open plan office to focus and to, to blot out the rest of the distractions available to me. And I have come to love, and I'd love to know if any of you have too, the Discover Weekly playlist on Spotify. And what this very simply does, if you haven't, is it looks, Spotify looks at the music I listen to. It looks at the music I've bookmarked and starred and favorited. And it starts to curate for me on a weekly basis 20 or 30 tracks that it thinks, based on its algorithms, I might like. And guess what? I love them. Not all of them, but every week I find myself portioning away a good five or six of them and listening to those tracks over and over again. So algorithms determine what music you listen to. They definitely determine which way you go. So when you jump in that cab on your way to the airport, whether it's you driving with your GPS or whether it's the cab or the Uber, the route that is being determined is increasingly driven by real-time data that Waze or Google Maps or TomTom Tom is, uh, is collecting, and then the algorithms are computing and recommending the route that you take. That's pretty fundamental. That's about how you tra travel around in a metal box on wheels. It's, a, it's about the decisions of the actual roads and railroads and, and highways that you actually travel down. Increasingly, Algorithms also determine where we work. So if you or a friend trained as a junior doctor in the US, you will have heard of the matching process. And part of that, part of that is algorithmically driven, which means where you end up living. It means where you end up working. It means the people that you end up socializing with, maybe the new connections that you make, where you may decide to spend the rest of your life, all decided by an algorithm. And in fact, your health here in the US is strongly managed by algorithms. So, you know, big medical providers, healthcare institutions are users of data. Some of you guys may be. And I love this quote that I found in researching this talk from Wired magazine. This guy, Frank Pasquale, a law professor at the University of Maryland, points out that if you own a large vehicle but have no children, you're more likely to be overweight. And if a health insurer Purchase that, purchases that data, then they will use that, their models, their algorithms will use that to, to change the health insurance premiums that you pay. Algorithms are now even playing a role when we meet people. So when I was arranging to discuss my talk at Social Media Week with Toby, the organizer of Social Media Week, he was trying out an AI assistant that some of you may have come across called Amy. Uh, it, was, it was a little bit dysfunctional as a process. It, you know, you'd think that these kind of robot assistants would be very helpful, but I asked my real human assistant, Tara, to work with Toby and Amy. Um, unfortunately, Amy was relentless. She was like a robot with, with lots of options to meet, but no ears to hear that that wasn't the right time. And I had to point out, unfortunately, to Amy that Amy, I can't help. You need to work with my assistant, Tara. But what about Tinder? You know, algorithms are deciding who we meet, who we connect with, who we kiss. This is having a fundamental effect on our lives, who we go on to marry and partner with. And I love this quote. I recently switched from an iPhone to a Samsung, and it was really hard work training my keyboard to swear and curse in the way that I wanted it to. So algorithms are constantly ticking away in the background. They're constantly either directly influencing and proposing the route that we would take to the airport, 
or giving us these little nudges about certain types of music to listen to or putting the face of a particular person in front of us to see if we want to meet with them. And while I was researching this story, Facebook itself was presenting me with news items driven by its own algorithms. So when, when, I, when I did read an, an article about algorithms, it then presented me with three more that perhaps I, I would be interested in. So this is the setup of the talk, and I guess the basic premise is, to finish this bit, is these little guys are working away in the background. You and I have a robot army that is doing lots of work for us, but we may not always realize it. They're trainable, helpful, useful agents. It's technology working for us. What a utopia. But the question is, who are they working for? Are they working for you? Or are they working for them? And the answer is probably both, of course. These algorithms do create value for us. They're crucially designed and controlled, though, by the few. And this gives those people immense power over our lives. Some of you may remember when Facebook admitted a year or two ago that it had been trialing tests to see if it could detect and I think even change people's emotions. These are really influential levers. And so the question next in this little discussion is, who controls these invisible hands? Who decides what the morality, the weighting, the agency, the direction of these, these brains which are less visible than the actual outcomes that they create? And at this point, you may be thinking, OK, Will, but what does this actually have to do with marketing and business and intelligence and the kind of stuff that Brandwatch does and that I do in my day-to-day -day work? Well, let me, let me try and take you on that journey a little bit. If you work in this domain, you know that research and intelligence are evolving, whether that's like secret service kind of intelligence or social media analytics kind of intelligence or classical market research. We're moving from a world of clipboards to a world of networks. We know from our friend Algorithmi that algorithms have been around since at least 850, the year 850. Market research has been around for just under 100 years. In fact, it's, it's, annual, um, it's, it's annual birthday, whatever you call it, a 100-year birthday is coming up. But this is all getting more precise. It's all getting more advanced. And I love this quote from my friend and colleague at Twitter, Chris Moody, formerly the CEO of GNIP, who's now the VP of Data Strategy at Twitter. And Chris says, we're the largest, we being Twitter, we're the largest searchable archive of human thought that's public that's ever existed. And that's quite mind-blowing. We see these libraries, these fantastic library institutions around the world that are physical hubs of knowledge and intelligence. But in this brave new world, we're creating brand new, real-time, rapidly searchable archives of human thought. And it's the internet. I know for every you know, sublime, mind-blowingly useful tweet, we've got 55 from Kanye and you know, a couple more from Donald Trump, whatever. Let's not get political here. But some of it is useful. So there's this vast human resource. And the point I'd like to make to marry this robot army with our world is your work can be, and maybe often is, an invisible hand. We collectively provide our organizations with insights. We provide them with data points to inform decisions. We make recommendations. We put time and effort into creating reports that we hope will make a difference. So we can be the invisible hands. We can use this more algorithmically driven world to get more good work done inside our organizations and have more impact. So what if every recommendation, every insight, every report that we worked for was like a little leaf cutter ant. It was like a little helpful robot. It was something smart and helpful, but it wasn't in an opaque black box that someone else controls. It's what we control. 
So to finish this talk, I'd like to end with two final sections. I'd like to propose how you and we can enable better decisions everywhere. So that's our hashtag squad goal. And then I'd like to wrap up with a few crazy ideas about the future. So there are four things that I think you need to do if you're going to create this, this invisible hand in your organization. You need to create some network effects. We need to create the effect of that the work that we deliver to our organization gets better the more people that use it. The internet is fantastic at this. Think about Yelp. Me and my family recently went to Miami for a week of summer sun, and it was lovely. And of course, the food was amazing. Cuban, Peruvian, Colombian, delightful. Unfortunately, on the way back, flying out of Miami International Airport, the options were somewhat more limited. And I used Yelp, my trusty friend, part of my invisible army, to help me find a good food option. And I think this was one of the best. It had a lowly two and a half stars out of five, the Islander Bar and Grill, pretty much terrible. But Yelp, like so many web properties, gets better the more people use it. It has network effects. And so the more people that rate and review, the more people that favorite and bookmark, the better the quality of the recommendations that we can get. And when I think about our work in social intelligence, it's often very siloed. It's often very point to point. It's from you, the provider, to recipients, to users, to your stakeholders and internal customers. On the right-hand side here is a very complex Brandwatch query. One of Brandwatch's real strengths is in the Boolean operators that it has although very soon we're launching an exciting new query builder which allows less experienced users to set up equally good queries in just 90 seconds. Anyway, enough of that product placement stuff. These queries don't get better because they don't have a broader audience. And one of the things that we're working on in Brandwatch is how can we build feedback in? How can we allow more people to cut and paste to benefit from really great queries that some of our other customers have made? How can we make this more like Google Docs, more shareable, more viral? I think that's a really interesting idea, not just for us as the, as the software platform provider, but for you guys. How can we make the insights that we all create more social? How can they be improved by bigger groups rather than just sitting in one inbox or on one PDF report? How can they be editable and massively shareable? Relating to that, as a second point, I think we need distribution. So command centers like our own Vizier here from Brandwatch, but not just command centers. The reason that these kind of social displays are so popular is because they take it out of the inbox and they take it out of the PDF and they, make, they put it on the wall and that's in front of the retail bank manager or it's in front of the C-suite or it's just a kind of ambient information radiator in the corporate lobby or in the, in the group area of the marketing team. We need to be thinking as a group of practitioners and providers, how can we distribute these insights that we create more, more broadly so that we can be more powerful as an invisible hand in our organization? So that won't just be displays like this. It will be through APIs. It will be through alerts, emails, apps, watch apps, whatever. There's a whole opportunity here. And that makes me think about nudge theory. Some of you, maybe all of you, have heard of, of nudge theory, but a quick recap. It's an idea proposed in a book that some of the most powerful work that we can do to get people to make better decisions isn't to um, hector and uh, lecture them on what they should do that's good for them. So eat less carbs or exercise more or drive slower or don't drink and drive. Lots of government messages fit into this category. But they don't work. And actually, the authors of, of, of this work propose that just putting healthy food at eye level in supermarkets is a really powerful way of nudging people's behavior at the moment that they would make a better decision. It's when you go to put something in the trash, and there's a couple of different trash cans, and it helps. There's some uh, visual identity that helps you understand that if you put that in the compost, it's going to be a better decision. It's going to be better for the world. On the right-hand side is just an email from our Signals product, which pings customers with the thing they need to know, even though they don't, didn't realize they needed to know. So it's about putting information into the palm of the hands 
at the key moments. And I love this example from Sweden. I hope some of you have seen it before, but if you haven't, check it out on YouTube. This is an example of nudge at work. So here on the left-hand side is a poor, unloved staircase that nobody takes because, heck, they can't be bothered. Instead, they'll take the narrow, slightly overpopulated escalator that will carry them up into the sunlight. And what these, um, these project people did was made the, the stairway experience a delight. They turned it into a piano. They made the decision between exercise and not exercising a choice between fun and not fun. And check out the video. It's just one of many examples of nudge theory at work. I think the point is, is how can we put the insight, the recommendation, the decision into the palm of the hand of our internal customer, our stakeholder, and how can we make it actually make them take action? How can we n close the gap between knowing and doing? Thirdly, I think we need to encourage people to be able to edit and um, adjust the reports, the insights, the recommendations that we're giving to them. I found this playlist accidentally. I think my son, he's 10 years old and he likes dubstep, which is um, a different conversation. But this Spotify tried to recommend to me this appallingly targeted um, playlist just because of my son's listening habits. Hardcore filth trap step is a genre I will never be interested in. But the screenshot shows you these little thumbs up and thumbs down at the bottom of the album cover there. I hope you can see them. Earlier, I, I suggested that so often these algorithms that influence our lives are, are opaque to us. We can't influence them. But, but sometimes we can. So I can actually train Pandora or Spotify to give me better results by using the thumbs up or the thumbs down. And some of you who've been through airport security in the UK and survived that process, hopefully largely unharmed, have noticed maybe that there are now these smiley faces as you go through security where you can train the, the customs officials in how bad or good your experience has been. You can hit a real smiley smiley or a kind of indifferent emoji or quite an unhappy one according to your experience. And all of this is giving the users of the service the ability to influence it and edit it. So we need to be thinking about that. The more you look for this, the more you see it. Of course, Amazon's, you know, people who bought this might also tend to buy these other items is a great example. But if you drill into it, Amazon now lets you edit and control these. You can say, yes, more like these or remove that. So if you end up buying something embarrassing for someone, you can quickly delete it. Um, you can see above that, Amazon will also let you train it about what kind of adverts you'd like to see. So all of this can be can be harvested and harnessed. And a good example about this um, that hopefully you will find interesting is about 10 years ago, a, a guy called Doc Searles proposed that we should shift from a world of customer relationship management on the left there, a, a world where the organization has the information and holds the information on us, the customers, to a world where the user is in control, where the customer is in control of their data set and decides who to share it with and when. And he called this VRM, so vendor relationship management. So moving from customer relationship management to vendor relationship management. That might sound really kind of out there to you, but when you think about the ad blocking movement, it's a very profound shift where customers are deciding where and where not to share their data with third parties. And if you look, in fact, to extend the example at the way that smartphones now allow you to set up and configure which data you share with which apps, including your health data, your steps data, your beats per minute, then we're, we are shifting to this world, or at least there are signals that we are. So it's worth considering. And then fourthly, to wrap up this section, you need more. So coming right home to social intelligence and analytics, you need more data. You need you need audiences, you need image analytics, you need location, you need global, you need it to be easy and you need it to be fast. And all of this wrapped up together will help you create a more powerful invisible hand inside your organization. So, you know, maybe you've learned some stuff there, maybe you haven't, maybe it's kind of interesting, maybe it's a bit abstract. Let's have a quick look at the future before we finish. 
So what I'd like to do now is just land a couple more ideas before wrapping up. I love this model that I stole from one of our clients in the uh, alcoholic beverage market. And he said once on a webinar that we were co-presenting co on that he always tries to break things down into the what, which is very tactical and raw data, the so what, which is the insight, it's the, ah, oh, okay, that's the light bulb moment. But really excitingly, the top value at the top of the pyramid there, the now what. And I loved, I loved that model. It felt really useful to me. And it talked to me about synthesis and about filtering and about getting beyond the basics and providing people with maybe less, but something really punchy and deliverable. Then I came across this model from Gartner more recently talking to one of their analysts. This is a Gartner model for how data um, is evolving and analytics in particular. They're saying that we're moving through this hierarchy from looking in the rear view mirror, number one, descriptive, to diagnostic, which is what a lot of us spend our time doing. Why did it happen? Let's drill into it and figure it out. To start looking ahead at numbers three and four, predictive, what will happen, and that's really tricky and interesting. And then prescriptive, what should I do? Which is, you know, the Shangri-La, that, that is utopia, that's Nirvana, that's what we all as practitioners in this area should be offering to our stakeholders and customers. Telling them, skipping everything and just tell me what to do. It makes me think of this particular campaign from the UK government. It makes me think about not concentrating on all of the available data, but zooming in just on the one thing that matters. The UK government wanted to reduce, as you would expect, reduce the number of children hurt by cars. And you can imagine, as I can, that there are many factors that would contribute towards something like that, a difficult issue like that. The weather, the, the way the traffic lights are set up, um, the rules and regulations on the highway, the, the, the training uh, that new drivers have to undertake, the ability of the cars and vehicles on the road. There are so many factors that might contribute. There are so much what and so what data to crawl through. But what the government had to do was decide what's the now what? What's the one leverage point that if we communicate it effectively will change behavior in this population? And what they did was they zeroed in on this one data point, this one powerful insight. And that is very simply that a kid hit by a car at 30 miles an hour has an 80% chance of survival. A massive improvement on a much worse chance of survival if they're hit just 10 miles an hour faster. So a kid hit by a car traveling at 40 miles an hour, there's an 80% chance that they won't make it. So there's a drastic transformation just in that 10 miles an hour. And the government was able to put a really hard hitting campaign together to help educate people that it's not 30 miles an hour because someone in an office somewhere decided it should be. It has a very profound effect on the outcomes for people. And that was a really hard-hitting um, and impactful campaign. There's another example that I really like, which is from a guy called Abraham Wald, who's a mathematician and academic that you may have heard of, whose work was very influential in the Second World War. He was given this project. He was told, here's the data that we have from planes that make it back from missions, from bombing missions. And here, every red dot represents where they got hit. But obviously, lots of our planes don't get back. So we want to armor them to protect them. The thing is, they said to Abraham Wald, we can't armor the whole plane because the plane will be too heavy to fly. So we want you, based on this statistics, to tell us where to armor the plane. And at the point that he joined the project, the obvious reaction was to put the armor over the areas that were most damaged. So wherever there are red dots on here, the, the, the logic when he joined the team was cover it in armor. That's the obvious reaction to the data. Abraham Wald said it was also exactly the wrong reaction to the data. He said they were misinterpreting it. Where they should put the armor was around the undamaged areas. Everyone thought he was nuts. But he explained that the data revealed that bombers made it back 
when they were damaged in these areas. The more important data was that those that made it back were also undamaged in the same areas and instead we should armor the areas that are undamaged. And you can see how that's a powerful just flip in the logic, an isolation of just a few key points made a profound effect to the decisions that were made. Here's a, a couple of final examples to tease your brain with before we finish. Self-driving cars are, have gone from sci-fi to a very close reality in just a few years. In fact, in a couple of years, we'll all be being whizzed around by self-driving cars. Philosophers have been asking a question for some time, which is, if you get in a driverless car, it's your driverless car, and you head off somewhere, let's say you're going to the beach on a Sunday morning, and then unfortunately something happens to malfunction within the car, and the car has two decisions at this point, because the car is driving itself. It can either career off to the left, down a cliff, and take you with it, or it can turn to the right and head into the field where there's a bunch of people playing soccer. Which option should the car take? This is a very real question. Algorithms will decide the answer. How that computer is programmed, that operating system, will make that decision. And it will be a life and death decision for either you, the non-driver, passenger, or for the innocent bystanders. What should the car do? Out of interest, most philosophers believe that the car should be programmed to avoid bystanders above all, because they didn't get into the car. They didn't commit to the risk. So unfortunately, the answer for you is, it's the left-hand option that they're going to take. And then to close, one last example. Can robots be lawyers? This is an example of a robot lawyer right here. A guy in the UK, I think he was 18 at the time, built this robot lawyer, which will claim back unfair parking tickets. You, you go and talk to the robot lawyer through the internet. You answer a series of yes-no questions. It has challenged over $3 million worth of parking tickets in the UK. So we are living in a world, to recap, where these trained assistants are helping us make better decisions everywhere. Some of the time they're not controlled by us. Some of the time it's not editable. Some of the time it is. And what I'm arguing in this little thought piece is that we should think about that and we should be inspired by that. And in our work as providers of insights, as people who help others drive decisions, we could think about the ways that we can offer that impact and be nudging people to make better decisions every day. So that brings us to the end. As I said, I am at Will McInnes, and we will now take a few questions. Uh, and my assistant, Ashley Simino, is presenting me with some of those right now. So the first question is, a lot of what you mentioned is focused on B2C. Is there an opportunity here for B2B organizations to do the same thing? Hmm. I think so. What I normally say with this question, I'm not sure if it's relevant, but what I normally say is B2C organizations have a huge opportunity and a huge challenge, which is tons and tons and tons of customers. B2B organizations have a different opportunity and a different challenge, which is much fewer customers, but they're much higher value. How would that work? Hmm. Don't know. Let's carry it on on Twitter. So, number two, you talked about market research. Are there other uses or use cases that this would fit into? Um, I think so. I think what I'm trying to talk about is the creation of insights inside organizations. So market research provides lots of insights, but so does PR, so does... Um, strategy, so does operations, logistics, point of sale, retail, product, engineering. I think really, although I have zoomed in on market research, what I'm really thinking about is 
How do organizations make smarter, faster decisions in a networked world? And yeah, I think there are loads of use cases. I would encourage you to think, well, what do I do in my organization today? And how can it be those four points that we had? And I think we'll be sending the slides out afterwards. Yes, we will. We'll be sending these slides out afterwards. Is go back to those four points and use those as a prompt, because I think that's where you'll find the answer. Then the third question is, besides simple buzz metrics, what are some examples of the type of data you distribute through social command centers? Yes, I love that question. What I think matters is not social vanity metrics. I like, and I'm a CMO, I like correlations. I like data that we see behaving in interesting ways in pairs. So I like things like a blend of data. What happens to, let's take a buzz metric, like share a voice when we do XYZ business decision that has nothing to do with marketing activity? What happens to share of price, in uh, sh share price, sorry, in relation to net promoter score over time? So what we're seeing happening with um, those social displays is actually the biggest demand we're getting from our clients, like you, is let me input non-social data alongside social data. One of our clients um, it is a B2C example, I'm afraid, uh, an ice cream making company found that weather has a very big impact on purchasing of their product, but not sunny weather. Actually, rainy, horrible weather means that more people go out and buy their ice cream because they want to curl up on the sofa, watch House of Cards and bint. And so it's insights like that. It's tracking blended data, I think, is really interesting. So going beyond um, social buzz metrics and looking at things like point of sale data, weather data, uh, net promoter score or customer satisfaction data, call waiting time data in the call center, all of these things, like I think that's where really interesting answers are. Products, you know, buzz in relation to specific prod product launches um, and then matching that with actual footfall in stores or dealerships or visits to website traffic. I think there's really rich opportunities there. I've given quite a long answer, sorry about that. Are there any more questions that we have right now? No more questions. Good, well that is it, thank you very much. And if you'd like to find out more about Brandwatch, give us a shout, we are here to help you. We have lots of fantastic examples to share. If you'd like a demo, a tailored demo to your particular needs, please fill out that form and we'd love to assist you. And if you'd like to carry on the conversation, like I said, I and we are here. Um, so thank you very much for your time and attention and we hope to see you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>